Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Reason and Theology Show. I'm your host, Michael Lofton. It's a Monday night, joined by my co-host, William Albrecht, and Father Deacon Anthony, returning guest. How are you, Father? Fantastic. How have you guys been? Great. Good to have you back on. We really enjoyed your last discussion, so I'm looking forward to this one. It was a blast. I love talking with you guys. Yeah, so you're an Eastern Catholic deacon. Tell us a little bit about yourself for anybody who's watching who, who didn't see the last episode. Sure. I'm a, a Eastern Catholic deacon in the Ukrainian Catholic Church. I serve two parishes in the Pennsylvania area, in central Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I'm also a college professor. I teach at Mount Aloysius College, which is a Catholic college in central PA, and um, I do a lot of writing, dealing with spirituality and theology, and uh, it's something I enjoy. I love teaching people about the faith. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, um, let's let's dive in. We're talking here about priestly celibacy because you know that was one of the things that we wanted to touch on. One of those different uh, disciplines that exists between East and West. Mm -hmm. So, talk to us a little bit about priestly celibacy first of all in the uh, the discipline or at least I should say the perspective on the Latin discipline of priestly celibacy through Eastern Catholic guys. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to be clear. I have no interest in changing the Latin discipline. That's not my fight, right? right. Uh, my interest is primarily in them defending their discipline without attacking ours. And that's the, the issue that got me interested in all of this. Uh, what I discovered was that a lot of the arguments for mandatory priestly celibacy in the West were unintentionally denigrating our married Eastern Catholic priests. And uh, that got me very concerned about this a number of years back. And I started researching the issue and trying to learn more about it. Uh, my thoughts on the Latin discipline, again, from an Eastern Catholic eyes. Well, I see the beauty and the value in it. I understand how important celibacy is, both in the West and in the East. And I understand that for many in the Latin church, the concern is if you abolish priestly celibacy, celibacy is gone. That's what happened in many of the Protestant traditions, for example. Uh, but in the East, we don't see it that way because for us, celibacy is very much alive in the monasteries. And it's something we greatly value. I mean, for us, celibacy is just as valued as it is for those in the West. But for us, we very much associate it with the monastic life. So we love our celibate monks, whether they're priests or not. And we understand the witness of that, you know, eschatological witness, but also an ascetical witness. In the West, my concern is that they've taken celibacy and they've made it this part of the priesthood while divorcing it from the rest of the ascetical life that traditionally accompanied it. And in the East, our general feeling is that celibacy is best lived in a community. If you have a bunch of people committed together to living a life of asceticism and they're celibate together, uh, it's easiest that way to grow in holiness and to deal with the temptations that might come with it. Our fear is always that if you put somebody in a situation where they're celibate all alone with no community to support them, that you're setting them up for a possible failure. Um, so from the Eastern perspective, celibacy, divorce from community uh, is potentially dangerous. And celibacy, divorce from monasticism doesn't make as much sense as celibacy that's connected with an ascetical lifestyle altogether. I mean, what I've seen is a lot of Catholic priests in the West um, live effectively like bachelors. They have got a rectory, um, they drive a nice car, and in every way they live like a, they relate people in their parishes, except for the fact that they're celibate. And celibacy taken alone like that, I'm not sure it works too well. Uh, my feeling on the matter would be the Latin church would do very well if I found a way to have community for celibate priests. Even if they can't live together in a rectory because there's not enough of them, maybe some sort of uh, community fellowship where they connect with each other on a regular basis. Because right now it just seems to me they're they're alone, and I think that's a big a big problem. So somebody is going to probably say, "Well, wait, 
Paul talks about celibacy and he also lauds it and he does so in connection with ministry because as somebody who's celibate you're not tied down to the duties and obligations that you would provide have to provide to a wife so it frees you up to be able to devote it uh, devote yourself entirely to the spouse the bride of Christ so um, what would you say to that I agree with it I understand the logic behind that the question is making it a mandatory condition for priesthood that that's when it becomes uh, potentially problematic but again I can see it working beautifully under the right circumstances and I think the big thing is community having a support network for the celibate priest uh, I'm not sure if this exists everywhere but years ago I ran across a group of priests called the Fellowship of Priests, I believe, and uh, or something along that lines. And they would get together and they'd have meals together, they'd pray together. Even though they were all separate in different parishes, they found a way to connect and support each other. I think if you're going to mandate celibacy for the priesthood, you need to mandate some form of community uh, to support them. Mm -hmm. So you, the rub here is not that priestly celibacy is perhaps the highest standard, I guess we, we could put it, but mandating it, uh, making it mandatory. I think that's where you're, you're saying the rub is, correct? I, I think the rub is mandating it without mandating With, Without the, the yeah. community, right. Yeah, I, I uh, but okay, let, let's say they have this program where all priests have community in the, mm -hmm. in the Latin rite. Are you still saying, okay, but... You're, you're mandating priestly celibacy. Are you still going to offer a critique there? Or are you going to say, no, I don't have any more criticisms? My, my only criticism would be when the defense of celibacy means denigrating the Eastern practice. Uh, that's where my criticism is. Uh, my other criticism, too, though, is the secrecy that sometimes comes with mandatory celibacy. And again, I think the community aspect would help alleviate that. What do I mean by that? Well, I've seen this play out so many times where I've known priests over the years in the Latin tradition who had a hard time living alone as celibate priests. Sometimes they'd get into relationships and they didn't want to, but it happened and they felt they found it difficult to resist for whatever reason. And they're living with a secret. And I think that that breeds a culture of secrecy. I've seen that happen where a priest may have a mistress on the side and discover that another priest is involved perhaps in an inappropriate relationship with teenagers. He's not sure but he suspects it, but he doesn't want to look into it too much because his own secret might come out. And I, I see a whole cultural culture of secrecy around that, which I think is very problematic. Um, but again, mandating some form of community might actually help with that. And again, I know there are many priests who live alone just fine, who serve the Lord faithfully, who are very, very holy men. Uh, but I would think that most men have a hard time with that. I think they need the community support to really live this out without falling into various traps, without being uh, becoming part of the problem of the secrecy. I'm of a similar mentality insofar as I would say, yes, priestly celibacy is the uh highest calling it is the best but mandating it i would not say his best i would say you know, it, it should be optional but of course I'm, I'm i'm not saying it should be optional in the case of the latin right at this point it would make very little sense to start reversing a practice is that is this ancient in the latin right uh but to at least continue to allow the Eastern Catholics to have it and not denigrate them. Yeah, and, and to be, be clear, the approach. and to be clear in the East, um, we would not say that priestly celibacy is the highest form of priesthood, but for us, we would associate celibacy as being a higher state of life in the context of monasticism. Mm -hmm. For us, the monk living out the celibate life is seen as a calling just as glorious and you know, just as important as being a priest to a celibate. Mm -hmm. So what would you say maybe to those like myself who would um, perhaps say that one of the things I've noticed about, and it could just be the experiences I've had, and they may, might not be 
really indicative of the whole. It could just be my subjective experiences. But my experience has been that um, celibate priests, for the most part, are harder to relate to, and married priests with families are much easier to relate to, especially when it comes to talking about issues of being a father and things like that. Not that a uh, celibate priest can't talk and, and offer helpful things on those things. I, I'm not saying that. Just saying my experience has generally been it's easier to relate to uh, a married man and they tend to be more down to earth. But I know I'm painting with a broad brush here because there's exceptions all over the place. Yeah. What would sure. you say to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say there are exceptions. But in general, uh, I think a lot of people feel more comfortable with a priest who can relate to their life experiences. And again, I'm saying this as somebody who, who lives in the world of Eastern Christianity. Uh, my last three pastors were married men with families. And I know for a lot of people, um, going to a priest who's married with kids, who's lived a life like what they live, they find that a little easier to relate to. But I've also known many excellent priests who are celibate who could also relate just as well. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's definitely painting with a broad brush here. There's exceptions all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those things I, I think that I've um, at least subjectively noticed. Now, William, I want to pass it on to you to get some comments and questions in here. Thank you, gentlemen. Y'all able to hear me all right? Yeah, we can yep. hear you. Wonderful. Making sure my mic is working okay. Great, great discussion. I want to add um, to the point that uh, Father Deacon made that was a really, really good point. I have as well encountered priests that are celibate that have been very, very good, been able to relate to issues that you really wouldn't think that they would be able to relate to in terms of, okay, what you want to discuss things with them in terms of marriage issues or relationship issues. I think in part, I think a lot of it may have to do with the, the incredible amount of families they work with, the incredible amount of experience they have dealing with people with everyday issues, the fact that they I mean, all around, I've got to tip my hat to the Latin priests, to the Eastern Rite priests. They're fantastic. Uh, we have a lot of great priests, and we're really, really blessed in, in that regard. I, I think that is in. in uh, I think. Would you say that maybe that's why some of the um, non-married priests can give such good advice, Father Deacon? Is maybe they, maybe they've dealt with a lot of those kinds of people situations, if you will. Absolutely. And they grew up in families as well. And they know the dynamics of living in a family. <laughs> um, you know, an analogy would be, you have a doctor who treats cancer. Does he have to have cancer to treat it effectively, right? You know, if a priest understands the dynamics of how a family works, I think he can deal effectively with a family without having a family of his own. Great, great point. One thing that I do, and I'm really, really interested to, to to discuss this with you because this very point came up today hmm. were any of the early church fathers celibate and on an interesting point were any of the eastern fathers celibate early on or was there kind of like a mixture do, do you uh, would you be able to answer that at all yeah when we talk about the church fathers the majority of the ones we think of are the ones who did a lot of the writing and right. most of those guys both in east and west were celibate okay and part of that was they were monks most of them were monks or lived a monastic existence of some kind. That is a really, really good point. And so I, I know that the the kind of monastic life is spoken of by St. Ambrose, where a lot of these fathers really stole the incredible virtues to be found within the celibate life. So I guess that kind of is a really good point. But then we, we also have the other flip side where I've I've had people come up to me and they tell me, hey, how come you guys argue that priests cannot get married when, you know, the Pope, Peter, uh, had a mother-in-law? Mm -hmm. And I know you've heard this many times over, but that brings me to my other question. Is it possible in your mind, do you think, and even Michael can chime in, do you think that maybe 20 years down the line, we would be looking at priests, um, being allowed to get married all the way around. Is that, a, is that a possibility? Do you think that's a possibility? And then for the audience to get a clear picture, because I know some people are tuning in that really don't know, but is priest celibacy, is it a doctrine? Is it a, 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 what would you call it? How do you describe it? Yep. Great questions. Uh, first of all, the first question was about it uh, changing. 
Yeah. yeah. So first I got to clarify some language here. Um, in the Eastern tradition, it's the same in the West. Once a man was ordained to major orders, he cannot get married. So Very good point. a lot of discussion about priests getting married, you know, the reality is no priests are getting married in either East or West. Uh, married men are being ordained as priests, but once you're ordained as a deacon, you cannot get married. Uh, before I was ordained, I had to sign a paper promising that if my wife were to pass away before me, I would be celibate. And you know what? I was fine with doing that. My wife was fine with doing that. She's irreplaceable, right? <laughs> she knows that. Um, so that's the key thing here. No priests are going to get married either way in East or West unless something really dramatic changes somewhere, which I don't see happening anytime soon. But regarding the Western discipline changing in the next 20 years, um, I don't think it's likely. Is it possible? Maybe. Um, but I think there'd be enough opposition to it. And in many cases, for good reason. I don't see it happening anytime soon. And I'm not sure it should happen in the West. Um, I don't really understand the situation there as well as people in the West do. And and then the kind of the other question that frequently does get answered, get get asked is, and I know some people tune in and are wondering as well, how would we describe the issue of priestly celibacy? Is it a teaching? Is it something that is doctrinal? How would you describe it? It is definitely not doctrinal. It's a discipline. And as a discipline, it can change. Now, what really concerned me, uh, again, I stumbled upon this 20 years ago, was people trying to make it into a doctrinal issue. I've seen that happen. And there's been a real resurgence of this in the past even 10 years of people trying to claim that priestly celibacy is doctrine. Uh, that's an apostolic tradition that the church has no power to change. And that concerns me because that basically means that all of Eastern Christianity has abandoned an apostolic tradition and that our priests are somehow um, ontologically inferior. And people have made that argument even the past two years, I've heard it from very high-ranking people in the Latin church. That bothers me a lot because, number one, it's completely untrue. And number two, um, that's really causing a problem where the Eastern church is looked upon as being inferior, less faithful to the tradition of the apostles. And it puts us in a situation where we are basically being belittled by our brothers and sisters in the same church. That, that that really is uh, quite unfortunate, I'd have to say. I've, I've, I've noticed that as well. Uh, the, I'm very glad that you don't find that here at Reason and Theology. We have a, a great, a real great appreciation. In fact, we I would even argue that we believe that Eastern Catholicism is necessary. It really is. We, we really have a great appreciation for it. But I'd like to ask you your thoughts. What can be done, in your opinion, to maybe make the other side that kind of don't truly appreciate that other other viewpoint to appreciate it better. Is there anything that can be done? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, More dialogue, maybe? Uh, which viewpoint are you talking about? The, 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 the fact that you shouldn't look down upon married priests, because I have, yeah. without naming, I'm not going to name anybody, but I'm sure that you're aware of the far, far uh, traditional leaning groups sometimes will disparage a priest. They'll make videos or articles and say, well, wait, who cares for the opinion of that priest? That's a married priest. And I find that kind of language and dialogue to be more harmful rather than, uh, rather than fruitful. Is yeah. there any way to have a helpful, fruitful discussion and say, hey, there's, you know, we're not inferior. You know, there's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, if, if somebody's really entrenched in a position, it's hard to make them change their mind. But in my experience, one thing that does cause people to rethink this is, that the, is if they get to know married priests and see them in action and see how they minister. Uh, for a lot of people, that makes all the difference. It's one thing having married priests in your mind as this mythical creature you don't understand, but you're trying to defend against. It's another thing to sit down and have a beer with a married priest, attend a liturgy celebrated by a married priest, be ministered to by a married priest. Uh, that changes opinions more than anything. And you know, I want to just add to this really quickly. One thing that frustrates me when I see all these debates about the married priesthood in the West 
because they always talk about it like a mythical, strange thing. Yeah. And if, if the married priest came into existence, horrors would happen beyond our imagination. <laughs> and I keep thinking, my world is surrounded by married priests. Uh, there are married Catholic priests, Eastern Catholic priests in full communion with Rome all over the place. They're not a mythical creature. You don't have to speculate what they would be like. You can go meet one. You can visit with one and you can see that they are good priests and they can be bad priests, just like in the Latin church. In my experience, whether a priest is married or celibate has very little impact on whether or not he's a good priest. But I think getting to know a married priest and seeing a married priest uh, would change a lot of minds. Great, great point there. One other question, and then I'd like to uh, uh, toss it on over to, to Michael, and maybe I'll pick your brain again later. The objection that we get from Protestantism, if you will, not all forms of Protestantism, but from certain uh, portions of Protestantism will that will claim that, in general, people should get married and have children. And this, of course, would deal with uh, priests that are celibate. You, as somebody who is Eastern, Eastern Catholic, how would you reply to that attack on, because it is an attack on Catholicism, because we're part of the one universal church, despite you being Eastern Catholic. How do you reply to that? Should all individuals get married and have children, or is or are some called to a life of celibacy? How do you reply to that, that kind of... Um, approach that you sometimes see from individuals that are separated from us? Well, the best reply is the example of Jesus. Now, Jesus chose to live a life of celibacy. And for a rabbi in his time period, that was an unusual choice, right. a very unorthodox choice. But he made that choice. And he talks in the gospel about people becoming eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven, people who are divorcing themselves from a sexual life so they could minister to people as representatives of God's kingdom. And we also see, you know, Paul talking about the value of celibacy, how he chose it and how a man who is celibate can focus on the things of God while a man who is married, his heart is often focused on his family. So very, very easily you can show biblical justification for celibacy being a legitimate choice that people are actually called to. And in the East, you know, in the Eastern Catholic churches, we really value that, you know, our monks, and we have male monks and we have female monks, our monks, whether male or female, they are celibate. And for us, we see that as a very high calling and a very special vocation, which we treasure. Father Deacon, that was a fantastic reply. And indeed, we also recognize that incredible virtue and beauty of the spirituality found in our, in the Holy Family as well. We know that example biblically that, um, our Immaculate Mother and uh, St. Joseph as well. Uh, they were married, but they never had sexual relations. So another great examples you make there. I just wanted to add that one point. Thank you very much. And uh, in a bit, I'll hope to maybe pick your brain a little bit more. I do want to pass it over uh, to my brother, Michael. So, Father Deacon, one of the questions of that. Well, before I ask a question, I do want to point out, there are some, celib well, let me rephrase, I'm sorry, married priests in the Latin Rite. You know, some some are not aware of that, but of course you can um, note the Anglican ordinariate has some, um, and even there are a few outside of the ordinariate that are Latin right priests who are married. Um, but shifting gears here a little bit, let me get uh, your answer on this question. Can you maybe give us some proofs that? this discipline in the Eastern Rite of having married clergy is apostolic. Okay, so when we talk about something being apostolic, it's really hard to prove one way or the other because the literature on the subject is pretty scant from the early centuries. Um, we know that Peter was married. We know that many early bishops were married. We know that was pretty common. Uh, but then the other side, by the other side, I mean people like Cardinal Stickler, Cochini, they would say, ah, all these bishops may have been married, but they were all continent. And the claim would be that 
immediately upon getting ordained or beforehand, they swore off all sex with their wives and never had sex with their wives again. And they would say that that's proof that it's an apostolic discipline. But the problem is you cannot prove that any of them were continent. Uh, what you can prove is that at least some bishops in the early church were having relations with their wife. And that can be proven. Uh, an example would be the church historian Socrates, writing, I think, the fourth or early fifth century. He talks about married priests and married bishops, and he mentions married bishops having kids while they were bishops, and that mm -hmm. was very normal. Now, I've seen some people in the very hardcore, you know, anti-married priest camp arguing that Socrates was a false historian and going after his credentials as a historian undermined <laughs> But wasn't one of the Cappadocians a son of a married bishop? Uh, yes. uh, of So, yeah. Yes. I, you know, one yep. example that I, I point to as kind of like the premier example of all this is St. Gregory the Illuminator. You know, St. Gregory the Illuminator, you know, the Apostle to Armenia, a great saint, a great church father. He was a married bishop. He had kids. And this is where it gets really hard to fathom by today's standards, but he established a hereditary line of bishops that lasted for many generations, where his son became bishop, and then his son became the bishop. And these guys were married clergy, and they were expected to have children to keep the line of bishops going. Now, again, to us, that seems really abhorrent, but in that time period, in that culture, that was not that strange. But the fact is, He's a canonized saint, and many of his descendants who are married bishops are canonized saints. And his son, for example, um, a married bishop who was producing children as a married bishop, was at the Council of Nicaea. He was one of the Nicaean fathers. Now, keep in mind that in those early centuries, you know, Nicaea and after, there was a lot of fighting going on among bishops. I mean, there was harmony, but there was disharmony as well. Imagine if somebody was showing up to ecumenical councils who was living in direct violation of an apostolic tradition. You know, you have a bishop showing up who everyone knows is violating the tradition passed on by the apostles. Somebody would have said something. Somebody would have made an issue of it, but nobody did. This guy was accepted as one of the council fathers at Nicaea. And everyone knew his father was a bishop and that he was fathering children as a bishop and that his son would be the bishop next. So again... Do we know his name, by the way? The name of the son? Um, yeah, the the one who attended the Council of Nicaea. <laughs> offhand. That, that's okay no, if you don't know offhand. <laughs> I have it in a document, probably in a pile next to me somewhere if you want me to look it up. Maybe during the break I can look it up for you. Uh, you're, you're good. Maybe, but, maybe um, post it in the comments after. I, I'd just be curious to know yeah. that's all. <clears throat> I, th I think that would somewhere. be yeah. yeah th that'd be fun to chase down. <laughs> but for me, that that is evidence enough that it's not an apostolic tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, if yeah, no, I think that's a really, really good point. Yeah. Uh, what do you make, however, of the Latin West having councils and canons really early <laughs> on that mandate priestly celibacy? Mm -hmm. So. I think that in the West early on, there was a push for it. There's no doubt about that, that there was a push in the West to associate celibacy with the priesthood. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. But that does not mean that's an apostolic tradition, you know, especially when you consider that many of the apostles went to the East and the Eastern churches were just as apostolic. You found no such push in the East. Um, so just because some councils in the West were pushing for celibacy or mandatory continence doesn't mean it's something that goes back to the apostles. I know the premier example everyone points to is the Council of Elvira, right? Uh, I know people make a big deal about that and really hold it up as being this example of the apostolic tradition of priestly celibacy. <sighs> Have they looked at the Council of, Nize the Council of Elvira's canons? Oh my gosh, um, you know, the Council of Elvira was a council in Spain uh, with only a handful of bishops attending, I think maybe 40 bishops, if that, maybe 20, I forget the exact number, but it was a small number. 
Um, but they addressed all kinds of stuff in there. And yeah, they were pushing for mandatory continence where priests could no, no longer have relations with their wives. But they also were having other pronouncements. Uh, for example, if a woman goes to a hairdresser, she's excommunicated. Mm -hmm. uh, that's such a serious offense that they must be excommunicated from the church if they go to a hairdresser. Uh, if somebody takes on the practice of being a mime, a pantomime, that's such a serious offense, they're excommunicated. If they recant, however, they can come back to the church after a period of penance. But if they return to the practice of miming, they're excommunicated permanently and can never be reconciled to the church. Uh, you know, if, if somebody's a chariot driver, they're excommunicated. Uh, I mean, the list of stuff in there is pretty exotic, to put it mildly. And holding it up as an example of apostolic tradition is pretty extreme because then uh, my wife couldn't go to her hairdresser anymore. <laughs> it saved me a lot of money, right? Right. Um, <laughs> but it's hard to hold that up as an example of being, you know, pure apostolic tradition. Yeah. And, you know, I was um, reading uh, Gabriel Moran earlier today, and he was talking about in this book on. Uh, it's called Scripture and Tradition, a survey of the debate, something to that effect. I forget the subtitle, but Scripture and Tradition is the title. And he talks about the difference between a divine uh, apostolic tradition and a human apostolic tradition. Uh, the former being something that is revealed by God through an apostle, the latter being something that comes from an apostle but isn't part of the deposit of faith. Hmm. So I think even if somebody were able to prove that, okay, look, uh, our, our practice here in the Latin West goes back to the apostles. It doesn't necessarily prove that it's divine apostolic. It just might be human apostolic. Have you heard some make an argument that in the West this is apostolic? And what were some of the best arguments that you heard? Some of the best arguments for it being apostolic? Yeah. Um, probably... Uh, some early councils that mentioned it, uh, early popes who talked about it, who commended it. That's about the strongest argument you can make, though. But nothing, yeah. nothing really convincing, in my opinion. Yeah. Seems like I've heard different uh, people out there say that both traditions actually come from the apostles. Have you ever heard that before? Um, not put that way, no. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for people arguing the one or the other is apostolic. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's really hard to prove anything because mm -hmm. documentation is so you know, sparse from that period. Yeah, and, and ultimately, it, when it when it comes to substantiating those things, I think the, the magisterium is really the one that would have to uh, establish that for us. Somebody was asking me that, about that in the chat. and There might be some indicators to trace it back to the apostles, but I think ultimately it's going to be the magisterium that would have to weigh in on that. And ultimately the magisterium has, in the sense that the magisterium of the Catholic Church teaches authoritatively, for example, in the documents of Vatican II, that the married priesthood in the East is a venerable tradition to be held in high honor. Mm -hmm. it, legitima it legitimizes the tradition of the East. That's the magisterium of the Catholic Church doing that. So um, they did weigh in on it. Mm -hmm. um, everybody go ahead and send your chat questions. Make sure to put them to at reason and theology. William, I want to pass it back to you for one more round of comments, questions that you may have. I think you might be on mute there. Y'all able to hear me there? Yes. There we go. Okay, great. It seems to be my thing by be looser in the back. Thank you very much for the discussion, uh, Father Deacon. I've greatly, greatly appreciated it. I think you both um, brought up some really, really good points there. And I have heard the argument, by the way, Michael, that some people have tried to argue for both sides being uh, apostolic, if you will. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember, correct me if I'm wrong, was it, was it, um, Gregory of Nyssa or Gregory of Nazianzus that actually ha uh, did get married and have children. Do you do you know Father Deacon? I don't remember offhand. I, I don't remember offhand. Of but I think Michael Michael might know. I, I believe one of the Cappadocians did have children, or maybe two of them did. I might be wrong there. Do do you know any chance, I, Michael? I know somebody mentioned it earlier. Nazianzus's father 
uh was oh. a bishop and he fathered him <laughs> okay uh, I, I know that much yeah so then i might be wrong then it might not have been one of the cappadocians it just could have been uh the father of one of them then yeah, I've never heard that the Cappado one of the Cappadocians themselves had, but I know that I was reading one of the Cappadocians, uh, and they mentioned that. But I thought it was um, Basil, but I guess I'm mistaken. Nonzianzus uh, evidently had a father who was a bishop, uh, Gregory uh, Nonzianzus the Elder. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. Father Deacon, I, I heard you, you you brought up um, Elvira earlier, and I, 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 re I recognize how problematic it would be, people pointing, going towards Elvira. I'm sure you know that there is an argument that some of those canons are even dubious, even later editions. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard to know what's legitimate there and what isn't. It is. It is pretty hard. As far as I know, there's really no, um, you know, really ancient list of those canons in the original language they were even penned in, right? It right. comes at a pretty late date. That is correct, yes. What, what exactly, for the audience, what exactly is the argument people attempt to extrapolate from Elvira? Because one argument that I am aware of, I've heard it brought up a number of times coming from Protestantism, though, is they'll attempt to extrapolate the argument that, well, look, even images were condemned at Elvira, but I've looked at the oldest extant canons from Elvira, and I know for a fact the condemnation of images is are very strongly argued to be dubious, a later edition. So what, what exactly is the argument in terms of celibacy that is attempted to be extrapolated? Off? Do, you, do you know off the top of your head? Yeah, it, it comes down to this. So, you know, there are canons from Elvira, again, allegedly, yeah. that, that argue that, that say that a married cleric must abstain from relations with his wife gotcha if he has relations with his wife there's a penalty i forget what it is but there's a penalty of some kind and the argument is well this is a, a council from i believe is it the fourth century is that yeah. right fourth century is correct so you know that's relatively early in the life of the church therefore it shows that this apostolic tradition existed mm. because the argue because the uh the council was early that's the whole argument in a nutshell and w wouldn't that also though um raise a few concerns when we realize that it was a local council um right it would kind of raise because i and, and i don't want to denigrate the the extent of effect that local councils did have such as we know carthage and hippo right were very very powerful in the church in terms of what they dealt with with the canon but we realize there are some other local councils that such as the Council of Antioch from 269, where it dealt with the deity of Christ, which didn't settle any kind of matters due to how local it was. We needed Nicaea several years later. So at, with that being said, even if those were, even if that was valid, even if it was valid from the council, it comes down to the fact that it was a local council and that in and of itself would kind of be problematic if people were to try to say, well, that proves that it must be apostolic. W wouldn't you say that that's a bit problematic taking that position? Huge, hugely problematic. Yeah, awesome. Well, Father Deacon, there, thank you very much. Uh, I do want to give a chance for the audience to be able to pick your brain. I've greatly, greatly uh, enjoyed this discussion. And if I can think of anything else, I'll, I'll, I'll pop in one of my questions in a bit. I do want to pass it back to my brother, Michael. Father, here's a question. Uh, why do some Eastern Catholic churches in the United States have mostly celibate clergy? Will this change in the future? Ah, excellent question. This, unfortunately, deals with a, a bad historical circumstance. So here's what happened. When the Eastern Catholic churches came to the United States, they came as immigrants, like every other group did. And what happened was the Roman Catholic hierarchy was established here first in this country. And then in the late 1800s, early 1900s, large waves of Eastern Catholic immigrants came over and they had no bishops at the time. So they would go to the local Latin bishop and the idea was they'd be assigned to minister to the local Eastern Catholic congregations. And many of the Latin bishops were horrified and scandalized beyond words that there were married priests in their midst. In some cases, they wouldn't let them minister. And this caused a bit of an uproar. It led to a schism, which resulted in the formation of the OCA, the Orthodox Church in America, 
was largely broken off from Eastern Catholics who were who felt forced out over the Mary Priest issue. And eventually, a lot of the Latin bishops petitioned Rome, asking Rome to step in and stop Eastern Catholics in the United States from having Mary Priests. And Rome obliged. So there was a, a, two different documents put out asserting this. So for a long time in the United States, uh, married men could not be ordained as Eastern Catholic priests. And this was a source of real pain and contention. And what happened was after Vatican II, this kind of started to fade away a bit. You know, at Vatican II had affirmed the legitimacy of the Eastern discipline, made it very clear it was legitimate. And a number of Eastern Catholic bishops began to um, ordain married men. They said, you know what? Vatican II takes precedence over a document from the early 1900s. And they began ordaining married men. And there really wasn't any backlash from Rome or anything. So a number of them started doing it. Uh, however, some bishops were afraid to do it and remained afraid to do it up until a number of years back when Pope Francis intervened. And Pope Francis, um, when he learned about the situation in the United States, I don't think he was aware of it initially. When he learned about it, uh, he realized it was a problem, not just for the Eastern Catholics, but also for the Eastern Orthodox. Uh, I believe what happened was an Eastern Orthodox priest who was part of the International Commission of you know, Dialogue between the Orthodox and Catholic churches, he brought this up. He brought this up at, at the Vatican, it's my understanding, that, hey, you keep telling us you will respect our disciplines, but in the United States, you're, you're opposed, at least on paper, you're opposed to our discipline being practiced by the Eastern Catholics. How are we to believe you'll respect our married priests if you don't respect your own? And that argument was a powerful one, and Pope Francis changed it. He removed all restrictions on married men being ordained as priests in the Eastern Catholic churches uh, anywhere in the world. It's up to the bishop. So, for example, in the Suramalabar church in India, uh, my understanding is they're still only ordaining celibate men as priests. That's a decision of those bishops. It's their choice. It's not coming from Rome. Uh, and that's a whole other story. That's because of the Portuguese influence there. But in the United States, it's up to the bishop. And all of the Eastern Catholic bishops in the United States uh, that I'm aware of, perhaps with the exception of the Sira Malabar, uh, they immediately began ordaining married men and because that's a tradition. And when that happened, uh, it was seen as a great thing for us in that it healed a wound. You know, the imposition of celibacy upon Eastern Catholics Eastern Catholic priests in the United States was a really sore spot. And it made us feel that we were not fully respected. And when Pope Francis officially abolished that, um, it did a lot to heal past pain. Excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. Base Byzantina asks, I've read that the Latin church once had a discipline where children born out of wedlock couldn't become priests. Does something similar exist in the East? I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of that. It's possible that it may have existed somewhere, but um, I have not run across that myself. All right. Here's another one from, uh, this one's from Hercule. Should Latin priests be permitted to marry prior to ordination, given how sins of the flesh are so prevalent? This way they do not burn without desire. Um, so should Latin priests have the option of being married prior to ordination? Uh, to prevent them from falling to sins of the flesh? Is that the question? Right. Um, if that's the reason, uh, I don't think it's a good one. Uh, in that, as a married man myself, I can tell you that married men can also fall into sins of the flesh. Um, a lot of married men fall into sins of the flesh. Marriage isn't really a, uh, a guarantee against that happening. Um, now, I think marriage can have benefits for a priest. I know, for example, that in my church, most of our priests in the parishes are married with families. And the priest's wife plays a very important role in the life of the congregation. She's a huge support to the priest. She's a huge support to all the lay people as well. 
So, I mean, that's a positive reason. Um, but to stop sins of the flesh from occurring, I'm not sure that's really a, a strong reason to make celibacy optional in the West. All right. Here's another one. Is not celibate priesthood the ideal in Byzantine church because it allows for daily divine liturgies, which is the ideal? All right. So traditionally in the East, the priest would not get engaged in sexual activity on the day of the divine liturgy. And you find that in the old canons. And um, ideally, lay people would not engage in sexual activity before receiving communion. Um, that being said, in the Eastern churches, daily divine liturgy, you know, every day of the week is a pretty rare thing. You might find it in a monastery. You'd find it in a cathedral. In some of the larger parishes in Eastern Europe, you might find daily divine liturgies. But those are situations typically where you have uh, multiple priests serving at the parish. Um, but in general, daily, you know, seven day a week divine liturgies is something that never really uh, got rooted very firmly in the majority of Eastern parishes. Now, the West, of course, has a tradition of daily masses. And that could be one of the reasons why uh, mandatory celibacy was seen as preferable in the West, because then people knew that the priest was, at least in theory, uh, not engaging in sexual activity when he was celebrating the Mass. This, are you able to hear me? Yes. I think I, I yeah. muted it and then unmuted it. All right. Uh, this one is from... Hercule. Father Deca, do any Protestants honor celibacy? If no, why not? Mm -hmm. There have been attempts to establish Protestant monasteries um, throughout the centuries. I'm not sure of any currently in existence, but for example, where I'm at, maybe about two, two and a half hours away, there's a community in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, the Ephrata Cloister, which was a Protestant uh, monastery. It was established, I think, in the 1700s, um, but it, it faded out. It faded out, and they were celibate. Um, but in general, celibacy has never really uh, taken root anywhere in Protestantism. And I think this is one of the concerns, too, that the Latin Church has. Uh, you know, the Latin Church often thinks in terms of what went on with Protestantism. That's often what they think about more so than what happens in the East. So in Protestantism, when celibacy was no longer a requirement for ministry, um, celibacy pretty much has vanished everywhere. Monasticism vanished everywhere. Um, and the fear is that if the same thing happened in the Latin church, if celibacy was not a requirement for ministry as a priest, that celibacy would vanish altogether. And uh, I'm not sure how things work in the West. I don't think that's likely. What I will tell you is this. This is very interesting. So in the Eastern Catholic churches and in the Eastern Christian churches, historically, the monasteries are vital to us. They're almost like the spiritual batteries that power the church. That's how we look at it. So every Eastern Catholic church ideally has a number of monasteries where people can go and be spiritually recharged and where the monks there are an example of holiness. And they're an example to all of us about how we live our lives as Christians. The monasteries are vital to us. In the United States, when celibacy was uh, imposed on all Eastern Catholic priests, our monastic tradition here pretty much vanished. We had very few monasteries, and the ones that we had were not functioning like Eastern monasteries. Um, there was one, for example, in uh, Pennsylvania where all the monks were ordained as priests, and then they were raided by bishops to go into parishes. It couldn't function as a real monastery in the Eastern tradition. Um, so in our situation, the imposition of mandatory celibacy in North America resulted in great harm to monasticism. What's interesting is, in recent years, more and more Eastern Catholic monasteries have been popping up. 
uh, new ones. And it's interesting dynamic there in the in the East, when you have married priests, the monasteries seem to do better. This is a really good point that I haven't uh, heard before. Uh, this one is from Hugh. St. Epiphanius of Salamis uh, seems to state in his Panaria that celibacy was quite widespread. Uh, is there many Eastern fathers that actively defend married priesthood? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that quote in particular, um, I researched it a while back and actually wrote something about it. I don't think it was published anywhere, but I wrote something about it. Unfortunately, I forget what I wrote. Uh, but I know what you're talking about. What I would say was, uh, in the East, there aren't a lot of writers defending uh, married priests um, in, in the early church simply because uh, it wasn't really a source of controversy. And typically, people wrote about something that was controversial or was being, you know, threatened or challenged. And in the Eastern churches, they didn't, they didn't see it necessarily as being something that had to be defended very often. Here's an interesting one. If the Latin Church, which is the largest in the world, abandons mandatory priestly celibacy, will this not perhaps tilt the world towards concupiscence, by example? Okay. And again, the witness of celibacy, I think, is important. A church that has no celibates uh, is missing something vital. I feel very strongly about that. But like I said earlier, uh, for us, that witness is found in the monasteries. And if the Latin Church abandoned mandatory priestly celibacy does that mean celibacy would vanish in the west again i don't know but maybe they'd find a dynamic like we did in the east where monasteries flourish that's possible yeah you know that's that's the point i've really never considered um definitely have to think on how that would impact the, the latin right um i don't see any more uh william did you have any final questions there i do y'all y'all can you all hear me okay yes yeah i do have one one final one and it, it comes from uh a little bit of what um uh, father deacon and, and a chat question were, were kind of um bringing up within protestantism i just curious to to hear your thoughts father deacon when we get to the time of martin luther we have the idea as you well know of priestly celibacy you know outright attacked by Luther and the other uh, and several other reformers, uh, Calvin, Zwingli, I'm not sure about Francis Turretin, but I know a good amount of them do it. In your opinion, why do they attack the idea of priestly celibacy? And on the other hand, in my opinion, I don't think it's to extol the virtues of the married life because they denied marriage as a sacrament. They strongly denied that. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that was really kind of reactionary to Catholicism in general or what can you maybe provide us some thoughts on that and that's pretty much just my final question I'd love to hear what you think about that yeah yeah uh, it, many of the writings uh, attack not just priestly celibacy but celibacy in general you know yeah. as, as a concept and um, what I what I would say is a lot of the people who were writing that stuff back then uh, were former priests or former monks themselves yeah and I think I think once you leave something, and you've taken vows to live a certain way and you're actively breaking those vows i think you become very impassioned to defend your your new position yeah so, what was even i even think of erasmus wasn't he uh he was a son of an an illegitimate son of a from a catholic priest i believe right so like, yes i seem to recall that i think that might have been why he he wrote against it as well mm -hmm. i think i think uh, a lot of them were reacting against personal experience um yeah. which is unfortunate uh, but that happens you know in my experience the worst anti-catholics are former catholics and you know some of the people i've met who were the most passionately worked up about abolishing celibacy were former catholic priests um and they wouldn't make the same arguments for a married priesthood that i would for example their arguments would be much more radical in some cases not all of them are like that but some of them are and very often people are reacting to their own experiences yeah, great point there. I do. I, I'm not trying to show uh, to make the comparison that you would take the exact position as them. I just wanted to know what your thoughts were in that. But yeah, I totally agree with you there. Yeah. Yeah. Last question here from Igor. Uh, something I've been seeing is that the newly ordained priests are more traditional in orientation. I think it's because of mandatory celibacy. Any thoughts? 
he's talking about mandatory celibacy in the West. Right. And he thinks that that is one of the reasons why he's seeing some of the younger priests being traditional in the West. I'm, I'm not sure uh, how that point works, because then wouldn't the older ones be more traditional since they also were mandatory celibate priests, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. Can you expand on what, what you think he's asking? I don't see it either. Um, I don't think that's the reason why we're seeing some of the younger priests being more uh, Orthodox Catholics than some of the older ones. I think part of the reason why is some of the older ones have lived through the spirit of Vatican II, yeah. and some of the younger ones have just that. That's not, you know, and some of the older ones, they're from that hippie generation, as yeah. I like to call it, that it's a very rebellious generation overall. I, yeah, um, can I jump in on that? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm enjoying this conversation. I want to add a bit more to it. So the, here's what I've seen. Uh, I agree with you. I think a lot of the younger Latin priests are reacting against um, the spirit of Vatican II, the whole <laughs> hippiness that came out of there. Um, and I don't blame them for reacting to that. Um, you know, for me, an eye-opening experience was a few years ago where I was learning how to celebrate the Roman Mass as a deacon. Mm -hmm. um, so I could assist with different uh, events at my college. I, you know, we have a wonderful Roman Catholic bishop here who's phenomenal. And whenever he comes to my campus, I serve with him and I, I love it. I love it. But I had to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. So I got a copy of the, you know, I forget the name of the book in the Roman tradition that has the, the missal, the missal. Yeah. Right? So I was looking through it and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, it presumes that everything is being sung. You know, it's presumed that that's the norm, right? It's, and then it, throughout it, there are multiple instructions for the priest to turn around and face the people at certain points. Right. Which is presuming that the priest is facing east, sure. like we do. And then right. there are all these instructions for the deacon to be incensing at various times, like I do in my Byzantine tradition. I'm thinking, this is nothing like the Roman Catholic parishes that I've, I've seen growing up right. in this area. Nothing like it. Right. So... And then I, meanwhile, I have a friend who's a Roman Catholic priest, who, younger priest, very traditional. He started doing some of those things. He started singing, you know, most of the mass. He started using incense. He, uh, he got in trouble. Yeah. He got in trouble for following the instructions in the Roman Missal. Uh, right. It just blew my mind. So I see people reacting against that. Now, I will say also in the Eastern churches, um, our younger priests are very traditional also. Uh, my pastor, he's an awesome guy. I want to give him a shout out, Father Andre Kelt, amazing guy. He's a young priest. He's like in his mid thirties. Um, very, very, very traditional in an Eastern way, mm -hmm. right? But very theologically orthodox, you know, very solid with the magisterium, amazing guy. He's a married priest. Mm -hmm. um, you can't attribute him being traditional to being celibate because he's not celibate. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a it's a shame also hearing about somebody would be disciplined for simply doing what the missile says. Wow. Um you know, this is why I always tell everybody you have to make four distinctions when we talk about liturgy. A distinction between Sacrosanctum Concilium and Vatican II, what it says, uh the Concilium of Bunini and what they tried to propose. The actual Roman r missile itself and what it says, and then what goes on in front of you in the average parish. There's yeah. there's four distinctions. And a lot of times what people do is they confuse what they see with the missile or what they see with Sancta Sanctum Concilium and Vatican II, and, and they, they don't make the proper distinctions there. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I've, uh, I, I've noticed this <laughs> being an issue for quite a while. Well, anyways, I really enjoyed the conversation, Father Deacon. I'd love to have you back on again and talk about another topic that, uh, love that. maybe is, uh, you know, a nuanced position and something that is a little bit different between East and West. I think that would be fun. Perhaps cool. maybe uh, infant communion. I think yes. would be a really yeah. fun one. <laughs> yeah. We haven't done any shows on that yet. And that's one that I... Uh, got find really important so um I, I think you'd be the great uh great guest to have on for that 
I would love that. That'd be awesome. Okay, well, we'll set it up after uh, after the show. Again, thank you for coming on. Uh, William, thank you for coming on as well. Everybody, thank you for your comments there and questions in the chat. Again, don't forget to comment, like, subscribe, share this on your social media, and also check us out, of course, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you would like to support us. And then also go to reasonandtheology.com. St. Maxim is the confessor if you want to check out free lectures. Until next time, God bless.